I am excited about this video. We are going to get to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is called state space. And the reason why I like state space, first of all, it's easy to use. Second of all, it's really easy to use if you're trying to code this up in MATLAB or C++, something like that. Um, thirdly, it's used a lot in industry. Okay, so this is a topic that is actually very useful to understand because depending on where you go work, you may see it again. Now, let's go over just a basic example. And this example is going to have absolutely nothing to do with system dynamics or controls. It's totally unrelated. It's going to be about a satellite. All right, and the reason why I chose this example is because when I was working in graduate school, I did most of my research on satellites. All right, and I'm going to show you the application of state space to a satellite. So let's say we have Earth right here. And let's draw a little satellite. So this satellite's moving along out here. And we can measure the position vector from the center of the Earth out to that satellite. Let's call it R. So we've got that. Now, for a satellite that follows just the regular old Keplerian motion, Keplerian motion is just the standard motion for an orbiting body, we have our equation of motion. The equation of motion is R double dot. And R double dot is going to equal negative mu times the position vector over R cubed. Now this mu right here is your capital G that you probably saw in physics times the mass of the Earth plus the mass of the satellite. Now obviously the mass of the satellite is pretty small compared to the Earth, but technically it goes in that equation. All right, so that's the equation of motion that we have. Now what I had to do in my research, I was actually looking at tethered satellites. So a tethered satellite is basically a satellite that's hooked to another satellite. And this is like a really thin plastic uh, tether. And it's got some copper filaments running through it. They have different kinds of tethers, but, but that's one type. And it can be used to generate energy and other things. But the issue with tethered satellites is when you're tracking those uh, objects, they don't appear to have the regular motion of a satellite because it's altered due to this force in the tether. All right, because this satellite if the Earth is down here, this satellite here gets pulled up, this satellite gets pulled down. So they don't exhibit the standard motion for a satellite. So my job was to figure out if a satellite was tethered to another by looking at some observation data. Okay, so that's what I was tasked to do. And in doing that, I had to use state space. So here is my equation. And the way I use state space is to create a vector. We're going to call it capital X. And capital X here does not indicate Laplace transform. It's just the general notation for state space. All right. Now what I did was I created this vector X. And what I was trying to do was numerically integrate this equation. Now the problem here is this is a second order equation. See it has the two dots. Now the numerical integration techniques that I wanted to use could only work for first order equations. So I couldn't use those techniques with this equation. I had to reduce it down to first order equations. State space allows me to do that. And that's why I used it. So this state vector here is going to consist of all of the variables I need to get to this equation. And you'll see how that works in just a second. So let's think about R. R is going to be made up of the different components, right? We got X, Y, and then Z. That fully defines that position vector, right? So here in this state vector, I put X y, z, because those are in the position vector. And then after that, I put the velocity components. 
and you'll see why in just a second. So we got vx, vy, vz. All right, so state vector. Now remember what my goal is here. I'm trying to reduce this down so I get first order equations. Now what I'm going to do next is I'm going to assign variable names for these. So we're going to call them state variables. And you can make up whatever names you want. I called that x1, this one x2. So basically this is saying x2 represents y, x3 is going to represent z, got x4 for vx, x5 for vy, and then x6 for vz. So now I've got that. All right. Now next thing that I needed to do, because I'm trying to get a first order differential equation, I'm going to take this vector here, or this matrix, and I'm going to take the derivative of that. So let's do that down here. So I'm going to do capital X dot, derivative of the state vector. Now if we do that, let's see what we get. We're going to get X dot. Well, what is X dot? X dot is really VX, right? Velocity in the X direction. Then next, I get Y dot. Well, that's VY. Z dot is VZ. Now when I get to VX, take the derivative, I'm going to get the acceleration in the X direction, right? I'm going to get AX. And I get AY. And then finally AZ. So now I've got that. Now, I want to write everything in terms of these variables over here. So that'll be our last step. So Vx is x4. Vy is x5. Vz is x6. And now Ax, well, I don't have Ax over here, so where am I going to get that from? Well, let's look. What is this? This is r double dot, so this is the acceleration equation, right? Notice it's got that bar, so it's a vector equation. That means you could split this up into the x, y, and z components. So that's where we get ax, ay, and az. And when you write it all out, if we go to ax, you're going to get negative mu times the x component of r, which we know is x1. And then you're going to put that over r cubed. Notice that's the magnitude of r. So if you write it out, you're going to have x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared and raise that to the power of 3 over 2. So this is basically xy or x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Because remember, that's what r was up here. All right, and then you would repeat that for a, y, and a, z. So all that will change is this variable here. So we'll have negative mu over x2. Denominator is the same. So you can rewrite that. And finally, you get negative mu over x3. Like that. Okay. So now, that's what we've got. Now what this allows, if you look, this is x dot. So all of these are first order differential equations. So I went from one second order equation with the r double dot to a system of six first order equations. So now I can use this with the numerical integration techniques. And then I could integrate and I could get my position and velocity components uh, at different time steps, which is what I was looking for. Okay, but this is the kind of stuff you're going to do in state space. We're going to create this vector. You're going to take the derivative. And then we're going to write out the equations like this. All right, and then in the end, we'll put it in the matrix form. Okay, so that's state space. So it's actually really cool stuff. It's used a lot. I've used it... Um, in many instances when I worked on missile guidance systems.
Uh, it's used all over the place in any sort of simulation where you need to integrate equations of motion. So now let's move down to the bottom here. So in this case where we have state space, our system dynamics will be described by what we're going to call a state space model instead of transfer functions. So we're going to get away from transfer functions for a little bit. Not too long though, they'll be back. Now the state space model is essentially just a description that's in terms of a set of first order differentials. All right, so that's what you saw up above. We had this set of first order differentials. We're going to write it in matrix form. And you do that because this is going to be used with numerical techniques. And the benefit here, it's all in matrix form, so it's really easy to code this up. Right, especially if you're using like MATLAB, where it's easy to work with vectors and matrices. Okay, so let's get started. Well, let's talk about our state space equations. So if our system is linear, which that's what we're going to have, it's going to be described by n state variables, r input variables, and m output variables, then we're going to get the following form. So we'll have an x1 dot equals a11 x1 plus a12 x2. And you'll keep going until you get to plus a1 n x n plus b11 u1 plus b12 u2. Go out to plus b1 r u r. All right, so that's your first differential. And we'll write down what all these things are, but the A and Bs, those are just constants. And Us, those are going to represent our inputs. Now we're going to have N of these equations. So you'd go down to Xn dot, and then here you'll have An1x1 plus An2x2. You see where this is going. Go out to plus a n n x n and then plus b n 1 u 1 plus b n 2 u 2 and then out to b n r u r. So we'll have this system of first order equations and then we're also going to have an output equation. So the output equation is determined by u you're going to select what output you want to see. Okay. So students always get confused with the output equation because they think it comes from the actual system itself, but it does not. You determine what that output equation is. So your output equation is going to be y1. y is just the standard variable they use for state space. Output. It's going to be c11 times x1 plus C12 X2 and go out to C1N XN and you'll have M of those equations because we have M output variables. All right, so CM1X1 and you see where this needs to go. So I go all the way out to plus CMN XN. Right, so A's, B's, and C's are all constants. Keep that in mind. So those are going to be dictated by, uh, like up here you'd have A could be your spring constant, for example. Um, B would be determined by your inputs. And then C would be determined by what you want for your output. Now we can write all of these in a matrix form, which is a lot easier to write out than all of this. So the matrix form is the one we're going to focus on. So let's just put use matrix expressions and with this we're going to have x dot. Notice this bar is indicating that that's going to be a vector. That's going to equal a matrix A. So if you want you can put a bar over that. Times x bar plus 
a matrix B times a matrix U. And then Y is going to equal a matrix C times matrix X. So this X right here, this is like that state vector we had in the satellite example where we had X, Y, Z, V, X, V, Y, V, Z. That's the state variable. Okay. This term here is for the inputs. And this right here you will figure out for your outputs. So let's define what all these are. So x dot is the time derivative of x, where x is your state vector. And then matrix A, that's going to be an n by n. And it's a matrix of system variables. And then matrix B is going to be an n by r input matrix. All right, U of t, that's an input vector. And basically that's an r by 1 vector that's composed of your input functions. So that's what we're going to have. Y is going to be our output vector. And then C finally is just called your output matrix. So C is used to tell, if you're doing this in a program on the computer, C would be used to tell that program what output you want to see. Okay. All right, so that is it. Now, I want to point out, if you look in a textbook, a lot of the times it's going to have y equals cx plus d. It'll have a d term over here. We're not going to use d because that's more advanced than what we need. That's for use when you have uh, coupling in your system. So we're not really going to have that. So we're just going to use y equals cx. All right, so if you see a second term here that has a d in it, that's what it is. It's just for more advanced problems that we don't need. Okay, so let's stop here. We'll pick it up in the next one with our first example.